Coming up on this episode, I finally watch the Hangover Trilogy, I check out the Matrix Resurrections official trailer, and I cross Casablanca off my list of classic films to watch. A. B. N. It's headphones nail! What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host, as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a trilogy of reviews um, just because I got a lot of stuff, I watched through a lot of stuff, and figured I would do one big blast of an episode. So I wanted to start it off as far as the Hangover trilogy that, um, as part of the, a part of the continued HBO Max um, watch through for the month that um, the films are streaming there. I hadn't seen them before and I wanted to see what all the fuss was about of the films. And as it turns out, um, The Matrix Resurrections, when it releases on December 22nd, will also be streaming on HBO Max and Casablanca is, um, as a classic film, is streaming there as well. So it all ties together very nicely. But as far as The Hangover goes, um, in general, I want to say that the films were pretty good. Um, the Hangover 2 is probably, or I don't want to say that 2 and 3 are any better or worse than the first film, but it feels like 1 and 3 are the most continuous of the films because the third one rounds out a lot of the story that you see in the first one. So if you miss the second film, you're not really missing too much, but you do get a lot of development as far as um, Mr. Chow goes. So for me, the second film feels like taking the first film to the next level as far as craziness, while the third film is kind of rounding out the story that we got in the first film. So in general, I enjoyed all three films um, as far as the crazy factor and the wolf pack losing somebody in each film. So that all worked nicely. I liked the acting, the craziness, the silliness factor of it all, and the general um, progression of the story. Um, as far as the best comparison film that I could compare to as far as films I've seen before is, I kind of want to compare it to um, Old School with, I want to say, Luke Wilson and Will Ferrell and those group of guys, so it feels like this is... Um, a variation on that, but more on the, along the lines of um, the marriage of the various guys and progressions and all that. So you can kind of see the um, real, the similarities and comparison. Easy to make comparisons as far as those go. Um, so in general, if I was to grade the films, I would probably give them a around a solid B. They're not necessarily particularly you know high cinema but as far as um bachelor parties go um hanging out going to vegas and things like that then the films do their job they're funny enough they're interesting enough and they kind of, they hold my attention long long enough to the point but where by the time the films end um it's not necessarily like how much time is left or what's going or what's um uh, going on or anything like that. If they hold, they're just long enough to the point where they're interesting enough, they're funny enough, and they're worth watching. So um, I'm not disappointed that I missed them when they first came out, but I'm glad that I can finally cross them off of my the bucket list of films I haven't seen, and I know what's going on as far as they're concerned. When people talk about the Wolf Pack, um, I don't want to say there might have been memorable lines, but um, all the characters are kind of relatable with like Stu and the dentist guy, um, Doug being kidnapped twice, um, Bradley Cooper's character being the um, guy who's who wants to party and kind of being the, and if, like, kind of being like the glue that's tying everyone together sort of thing and all that. So um, if you're looking for generally like college or high school level humor and entertainment and fun and good times, then The Hangover is a good way to go. 
Um, they can serve kind of as either sequels or pre um, prequels to Old School, but they're kind of, it feels like they're kind of set in the same universe, so if they do make a Hangover 4, I would kind of want to see all the entire cast of both films um, have one big um, group thing going on together to have a more grandiose film to tie that all together. But in any case, if you're into that kind of humor, then their film's worth watching. If not, then, you know, there are going to be films that you would skip anyways. But I would recommend starting with the first one going to the sec or going to the third one and then watching the second one i guess just as its own separate thing is probably the most raunchy of the three so that's why i'm kind of saying that it's not to say that it's skippable but it's not doesn't for the most part it doesn't really fit with the story of the first and third where the first and third um have a compl more complete story on their own anyways um but if you want more Mr. Chow, then the second film would definitely be on the list of the movies to watch. So that's all there is for that. So with that, I'm going to jump into my review and initial thoughts on the official trailer for The Matrix Resurrections. So this week, via the HBO Max YouTube channel, we got the official trailer for The Matrix Resurrections. So of course I gave it a watch to see what all the hubbub and fuss is about, and to see if it's something that I would think I would want to watch. On a nerd out and completionist perspective, I know I would want to see it, so I definitely- so I gave the um, trailer a watch, and overall I want to say that I'm kind of intrigued with what they're going to do with the film. So we have the trailer opening with um, Neo seeking psychiatric help and having dreams about the Matrix. He's not quite sure what's going on. And as it turns out, he's on some sort of medication in the form of the classic blue pills, which would probably explain why he doesn't know what's going on. Um, and he's talking about the dreams as if they're not dreams. So he feels like they're real, they're, they might be memories, but he can't be quite sure. Um, he ends, or later in the trailer, he does see, meet Trinity in what looks like a coffee shop, but they have no memory of meeting each other, so it feels like this might be uh, another iteration of the Matrix, either forward or backwards, or a reset with everyone having their memory wiped or something along those lines, where the machine world maybe somehow found a way to resurrect bodies, even if they're not dead or healing or something along those lines. Um, at some point, we have Morpheus giving Neo some red pills or a red pill to help free his mind and clear him of uh, whatever um, memory blocking the blue pills have been doing. So um, this and we have a different character or a different actor playing Morpheus. So that's why it kind of feels like maybe it's it could be something like the long lines of maybe Morpheus's son, a reboot of the Matrix where um, Morpheus isn't is um you know or maybe it's like a different residual self-image of Morpheus so, and same thing with Neo with his longer hair and unshaved face and that sort of stuff so um potentially all over this place and maybe it's one of those things where this new look for Morpheus is to help keep him under the radar now that he's definitely a known person of interest in the Matrix um, not to say that he wasn't before, but this is probably his way of getting around that. Um, and then we have a new character. I didn't make her or write down her name, but it feels like she could potentially be the new version of Seraph or maybe the new younger version of the Oracle or maybe even, um, I, I was about to say Sati, but we have Priyanka Chopra in the film. So, um, this is what's kind of leading me to believe that this film is taking place later on and Sati has now grown up and it has taken the place of the Oracle. So, um, she might be the catalyst or help continue to help Neo free his mind and recover his memories. Um, especially with the fight with, um, after the fight with Agent Smith and maybe with all of what happened that he lost his memory along the lines of, um, Daniel in Stargate SG-1 where he became an ancient or he was able to, um, uh, rise to the next plane of existence, but because he came back, he loses his memories. Even though they're still there and he gets them back, it's there has to be a process for getting them back. Um, and then ultimately we have, of course, the usual green tags. We have um, 
we have a scene showing what it looks like uh, Neo trying to stop bullets with great difficulty. So um, either because of the age or because he's he doesn't understand why he has these powers, so it's very difficult for him to do it. Um, but because he knows how to do it, he's able to do so. So along those lines of all these various scenes and you know some bullet time, slow motion characters um, shooting guns off of by running on walls and things like that. So in general, I'm very excited to see what is going on and um we close the trailer with going back to the matrix so i'm kind of curious to see who that guy was it feels like he might have been a co-worker or someone who knew neo or someone who's trying there to help maintain control over neo's mind so or even put you know someone maybe on morpheus's ship or something like that so we'll all see what happens but in any case the film is currently scheduled to release on december 22nd so I am definitely going to watch it. I haven't decided if I'm going to see it in the theaters or via streaming, but in any case, the film does look very interesting. I want to definitely watch it and see how they tie it all together. If it's um, worth watching, um, does it hold, hold to the um, previous um, iterations of the films, and how does it tie it all together? Um, so with that, I know as we get closer to the films, I'm going to rewatch the trilogy so I can make that better comparison. But as it stands right now, it does look interesting and it does kind of feel like, um, I, and this is going to be a bad comparison, but kind of like Bill and Ted 3 where it ties all the various storylines together. So I did like Bill and Ted 3, so, um, with The Matrix Resurrections, it does look like it will potentially tie out what we see on at the end of the matrix revolutions um with the seeming loss of neo but to protect everyone um not rebooting the system and what happens there and potentially what the new checks and balances are to keep the peace between the humans and the machines so uh with that being said i'm gonna jump into my review of casablanca so with Casablanca, I finally had the chance to watch it, or partly because I've been meaning to watch it to see what it's all about, but also because a couple of catchphrases from the movie that are misheard uh, were made popular because of it are in this film, and one notable Star Wars connection, which I'll get to at the end um, to tie it in with a related announcement that just came out. So. I want to say in general, the film was generally well done. They had very few um, places of note. It, was basically, it mostly takes place in that um, club in Casablanca. So I thought it was decent enough um, as far as the acting. Everyone was generally even and on point. I can't really say much of the accents. I couldn't really tell the difference between um, the German and the French and the American and all that. Uh, for the most part, they all sounded pretty even with the hint of a French accent so that was all kind of weird to me but in general I thought it was a decent enough film a bartender or a bar nightclub bar owners former uh, girlfriend lover shows up at his bar which is um, apparently this is a movie where that line of, of all the gin joints in all the world comes from so um, it's nice to be able to um, tie a movie to that statement is from um, and basically that guy the the club owner's story of helping her out getting her out and generally um helping people ex escape the nazis during world war ii so in general that whole story was generally generally well done and it seems like it's a movie that would be ripe for um adding color back into just to see the general fashions and um make it more of a eye-popping film um, otherwise, the as far as other known statements, um, play, the statement play it Sam is from the movie. They say it a couple of, or I think they say it maybe once but because with the main um, hero guy, Rick Blaine. But that's that statement that's heard, misheard and misrepeated over and over. So it's popularly um, rephrased as play it again, Sam, but that's never actually said in the movie. Um, the girlfriend of Rick Blaine actually says, play it Sam, and Rick Blaine, when he wants the pianist to play the song, he actually just says, play it. So 
um, I, well, it was nice to not only tie the statement to this film, but to hear what the statement actually is. So it's that whole Mandela effect of play it Sam versus play it again. So um, in general, there was that. And then it's nice to also hear that the kiss is just a kiss song is from this movie. And um, it's the ultimate theme of the film as far as lovers that have to separate because the girls previously married and then they meet up again many years later. Um, and then I kind of knew like in the back of my head that the, the line here is looking at you kid was from this movie but I had only thought because I had never seen the movie that it was only the one scene towards the end when Rick Blaine is looking at his girlfriend and he says it but he says it like five or six times so I thought it took away from the impact of that statement or it has more meaning than I um, would expect that it does. Um, so I'm going to try um, looking it up again if there's an actual meaning to it. Um, but I guess doing a quick Google search is kind of like a greeting like cheers, which um, like cheers or to your good health or here's to you. But that's a really long statement for that kind of greeting. So it feels like there's like that's a statement of its time, um, especially since Casablanca came out um in 1942 so uh watching the movie all these years later it has it doesn't it feels very out of place to say especially over and over so to me thinking that i had a deeper meeting made it that much worse knowing now what it means and the impact of it so i actually kind of didn't like that as much um and then as far as the general presentation overall it was good the set pieces were nice the only thing that actually stood out to me and i had to rewind again was um, in the first like third of the movie, the, um, Rick Blaine and some other guy are standing out in the rain talking, and then he goes back inside. And as he transitions into transitions from the outside into the under like the um, awning of a building, um, so he's sta literally standing in the rain with no umbrella, so he's all drenched and wet. And then he goes into the awning area where it's dry, and he magically becomes dry as well. So it was really strange to see that. So I don't, I, so I don't think it's one of those things that we were expecting to see or we're just supposed to catch. But it was just really strange to see it now. So rewinding it to double check it, it was really strange. So I think, as far as I could tell, that was really the only thing that stood out as far as weird technology. But it's it's one of those things that's of its time, and you're not supposed to notice um, because it's a quick, relatively quick scene and. Um, it was just really strange to me and it kind of stood out like how did he get dry so quick? Um, and then to round out the popular phrases from this film or the source of popular phrases, um, the film ends with Rick Blaine saying that he believes this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So the last phrasing that um, I knew of but didn't know was from this film and now I know. So. In general, while there was nothing particularly memorable about the film, it has a lot of one-liners that have carried um, down over the years that have stood out. So that's it's kind of nice to see that this is where a lot of these popular lines came from. Um, and having watched it, it is now good to see, now good to have that uh, reference. And I want to say as far as finally having a more modern context to the film, um, it was in the last third of the movie where it finally hit me that Rick Blaine reminded me a lot of Han Solo to the point where I did a quick search and it looks like Han Solo's character as far as persona, especially in A New Hope, was borrowed from Rick Blaine's persona in this film. So when you, so if you watch Casablanca and then you go and watch um, uh, Star Wars and you hope then you, you'll see those similarities especially um, initially when we first meet Han Solo in the cantina and then his various interactions in A New Hope and a little bit in Empire Strikes Back with Princess Leia that Han Solo is a lot more of a sci-fi version of Rick Blaine so I thought that was a particularly nice touch there. And I also bring that up because we now have a bit of good news that I've been expecting for some time. In that place, Tony has announced that there is a remake for 
uh, Knights of the Old Republic coming soon, and that's the original game, a remake of the original game from 2003. Um, from what I can tell, it's going to be a Sony exclusive, but also available for PCs. So I'm curious to see if that's going to, um, if it's going to be just a general standalone purchase, or if it's going to be available on a service like Steam. So. I am hoping that it, is, that it does come to Steam to the point where I that I would be able to um, play it on my PC and see how it compares to um, the original from 2003. So I am hoping that I am able to finish my current replay of um, Knights of the Old Republic so when the remake comes out I can compare the graphics and the story and the characters and all of that to see how the stand-up happens and see how well the remake stands up to the original. So that's all there is for this particular episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. So as far as gaming updates go, I have been playing um, Knights of the Old Republic 1 on Android using the Razer Kishi. So um, you can find those gameplay videos on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PatelN01. I just finished Terrace and I think I'm generally getting a good hold of the controls as far as um, navigation, movement, and all of that. Um, selecting or switching between my characters, um, the upgrade path, and that sort of stuff. The text is still small when upgrading characters, but um, navigation is easier using the Kishi. Um, as far as the joysticks and um, arrow controls go, so that makes it easier to move between the options rather than having to point and touch at stuff that's really small. So overall I'm impressed. So I just, as of the latest video, I've landed on Dantooine, so it's time for the Jedi Trials and upgrading my main character to um, that, to the Jedi, and then um, making those updates and upgrading the character accordingly. Um, I'm generally getting into the groove of upgrading all the other characters as well on an individual basis, being able to switch between their various um, um, set of skills. So, you know, upgrading Candorous with a rapid shot. Um, I'm kind of upgrading Mission Veo and Cartho Nassi Similarly, as far as their blaster goes, um, using sniper shot, but I'm making Mission the computer expert, and then I'm making Cart the um, soldier, so um, those particular upgrades accordingly there. Um, Basil I just got, but I'm making her upgrades um, based on... Try I'm trying to make her a healer, but I did have to pick various other... Um, upgrade points as far as her Jedi powers go, so I did set uh, give her um, Burst of Speed and I think it was Force Shield, so I'm basically making her the defense character, so the person with healing abilities and fast run until I get it, that ability, along with um, Shield for protectiveness and all that, so I'm going to upgrade her there. Um, I did give her upgrade her to, um, I think, Improved Flurry, so... Um, I might go along the same route as far as um, that goes, but I forget exactly how far I'm able to upgrade my character as far as, you know, improved and master flurry um, or critical hit or power hit and that sort of stuff goes. So um, I might continue, I might upgrade uh, my flurry first and then um, critical hit after that, but we'll see all about all of that as I get to it. Um, I haven't used um, Zalbar too much, so I'll upgrade him as far as power goes. Um, kind of mimic him and Candorous, but instead of Rapid Shot for with um, Candorous, I'm going to give um, Power Shot to Hanhar. Um, and probably pr um, Power Hit um, as far as a melee weapon goes um, along those lines. Um, so there's that. So, but as I mentioned, that's all there is for this particular episode. I'm going to continue my watch through on HBO Max of various stuff, um, and release episodes accordingly. But, um, if you want to find me on Twitter, comment on this post, provide feedback and stuff like that, you can find me on Twitter at PatelN01. The website is headphonesneal.reviews for past episodes, um, so various support options, including supporting the show and getting bonus content on Patreon at patreon.com slash PatelN01. But that website is headphonesneal.reviews. 
Um, so that's all there is. Thanks for tuning in and supporting the show, listening, subscribing, and all of that good stuff. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.